We're live. Hey, oh, everyone. What's up, buddy? We're How's live. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, my new TV show that I've always wanted to have, like a talk show, like, like you know, the late night folks like our senior hall. I'll just compare it to that guy because, just because. But I call it around the TV tray with Sarathne. Yeah, I think it rhymes. <laughs> so, but I'm raising funds for the um, for uh for the, our, our homeroom, the Tiranog Irish Pub in Daytona Beach, um, and getting yeah, some followers and, uh, on your uh, Instagram and Twitter and all that stuff and Facebook. But my special guest tonight is the godfather of Daytona Beach comedy, and um, his name is Zach Bennett. Hey, Zach, how are you? I think you're doing fine too. What's up, everybody? Uh, sorry if my connection's bad. Okay. Uh, what's up? Good to see everybody. How are you? Kisses. It's That's all it. That's all I got for you. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> we'll definitely power through it for sure. Um, I know how you're tired you are because you got a new gig and all that stuff. So. But uh, we'll talk about how we met and all that good stuff and talk about your comedy career and all that stuff. And, and I remember, like, being, like, um, new to town from moving from Colorado, like, three or four years ago. And um, I went to the open mic in Flagler Beach, and I asked if there was any stand-up comedy open mics. And they pointed me to uh, the, the, the Daytona Tap Room. And I remembered seeing you there because you wore, like, a Wu-Tang shirt, and I had a Wu-Tang stuff on, too. And I'm like... That's going to be my new buddy, but I was shy at first. Yep, you had on you had on a backpack. That was back when you were doing the backpack thing. Uh-huh. With all my camera you gear. Were, you'd stuff. show up with a backpack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, I remember it was, like, so loud in there, too, and, and, and it was, like, a rough room, and Travis ran it, and and then I, I asked around to see if there was any, any more, and then that's when I found out about the Nog. And then that's when we started bonding and then we became pals. And I remember like the first night I, I interviewed all kinds of comics and you were like my first one. And, and that was like a long time ago. But uh, what were your, like, um, your first memories like of the Daytona comedy scene and all that stuff? Uh, so, yeah, it was, you know, just the dog pretty much for a long time. You know, there was a couple of people who had ran some shows around town our buddy scratch ran a show for a little while before he had moved and he moved in 2009 to vegas so he moved right before we started the nog um so we never actually like linked up because you know everybody there's a lot of people from random maximum insanity shout out to them they're actually having their uh their anniversary show tonight um they already had it uh you know doing the online thing like everybody else so it is what it is but uh yeah, so we had all done improv, and then um, we just started doing it once a month at the Nog for fun, just to kind of mess around and do it with our friends. And we didn't even—we accidentally started a scene. We didn't mean to, you know. We didn't even know what we were doing. We didn't. We didn't have a light. We didn't. We took intermissions because we all came from like improv and theater, where you take an intermission and then you come back. Um, it wasn't until like. That was 2010. It wasn't until like 2015 where we discovered by other people coming from other sh other scenes and saying like, "This is not how you do this. You gotta you gotta let people know when they're over their time. You gotta not stop the show halfway through so everybody can go smoke." And you know, in Daytona, we're like, "We gotta have a smoke break. You can't just." <laughs> <laughs> and you can see it now. People still go out in the middle of the show or right at the beginning or never come in. Um, but yeah, so. Yeah, it was a it was an interesting time at the beginning because it was very experimental. Nobody was like trying to do specifically any kind of stand up or anything like that. It was just like get up and try and be funny, you know. So it was, it was fun, and we've all kind of sifted out through the years, different people. But um, you know, it's continued for ten years now. So uh, you know, whenever the world gets back to normal. Um, who knows when that'll be because we're all too stupid to uh, to fix our, our problems together. 
Um, and I, I, most likely stand up will not return in its full form anytime soon. It'll probably they'll, there's more likely to be a civil war before that happens. But it, but hey, you never know. Great things could happen. Um, but listen, when we're done stabbing each other to death and uh, fighting over race uh, so that there can be equality or whatever, because because there needs to be equality. I'm going to use this as my soapbox real quick. Thank you for letting me do that and the green. To... <laughs> you welcome. I, I got to, uh, you know, the, 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 the thing is uh, we need racial equality in this country and there's a bunch of people that think that it already exists and it doesn't. So to those people, I say, fuck you, grow up, um, read a book. Uh, anyway, uh, when stand up returns, come to the nog. It's going to be great. Indeed. I miss it so much. I miss seeing oh, that was you. as convincing as I sold it. <laughs> it's all good. I, I miss you guys so much. Like it's, <laughs> It was like my only outlet for like the longest time, um, and it definitely made yeah. Florida feel like home. <clears throat> uh, Daytona Beach mostly because that's where you guys helped me cut my teeth. I mean, if it wasn't for you guys, yeah, man, and oh, yeah, you, uh, you, you, oh. you, go ahead, go ahead, yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. If it lavish me with lavish me with praise. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> if it wasn't for you, it, like you all, like where else could we do thirty minute sets? you know like everywhere else only yeah. does like five seven minute sets and you're like you can sign up twice if you're Wu man chew and go up there twice and <laughs> that's the well, you of- can i won't let <laughs> make no mistake about it that is only because you are you if anybody else showed up in a costume and said can i go up again i'd say absolutely not unless i was short on people that night <laughs> <laughs> that, let this be a note to everybody out there if you want more stage time Take pictures for free of people and give them to them, and then we'll we'll all let you slide on a lot of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody came up to me, they're like, "Yeah, I'm. I already went as myself, but now I'm gonna go. I now I'm gonna go as a a, a, a fruit by the foot. <laughs> I'm just gonna. It's it's my it's my costume. And then they like rolled out like a a long red thing, and they're just like, "I'm I'm fruit by the foot," and I'd be like, "Okay." <laughs> I guess you're fruit by the foot and I gotta let you talk now. Um but yeah, so uh Sareth, you are an interesting dude who uh who does not conform to the conventions of the way things are, which is what honestly art in general needs needs more of. Um there's not a whole lot of it right now. Uh and I think that it's important that people like you are out there uh, not only supporting scenes by doing the thing like taking the pictures. I mean, you 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 knew full well, you know, after a little because you you did it out of your own. Uh, it's it's just the hobby of yours to take pictures, but after a while, you started to realize, I think that that it was important what you were doing. You know, um, you've documented a lot of uh, the you and Minas collectively have documented so much of what's happened to the dog that. You know, and and you were able to give people who couldn't afford to pay a photographer a, a lot of photos that they normally. I mean, people have, people got gigs because of you. You know, so wow. I think that's important that people know that, and people uh, thank you for that. You know, I, I'll be honest with you, man. I have not wanted to do anything remotely entertainment related, and I feel bad. I haven't really figured out how to tell everybody or what to say about it. I don't feel remotely artistic in the ways of comedy right now at all. I didn't want to do this live stream. I'll be honest with you. I I only did it because it's you. So, yeah. If anybody else asks me to do a live stream, just know I'd rather cut my head off with a rusty butter knife (laughs) live and uh, yeah, than, than do anything. It's nothing against everybody else. I'm not feeling it, you know? I'm just kind of waiting for things to come back, but but you you are the person who I decided I would put that aside for and, and then <laughs> talk into a phone. It's pretty simple. I'm making it sound like I'm making this huge sacrifice. I'm like, oh, I just don't feel like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't fucking feel like it, but I love you, so we're doing it. Awesome. I love you too, Zach. And just I love the, the, the nog and how, what you've done with it, you know, and taking over from it for Scott and 
I mean, I, I wasn't there for the Scott days, but um, like the lighting is always perfect. And you really put a lot of production, no matter whether it's an open mic or a show, like you like make sure the lighting is perfect. The audio is perfect. Everyone can hear you. And you get like all the people to calm down, even if you have to cuss at them. And so it totally means the world to us. And you treat everyone like your kids, you know, and, and it, like, you know, like, like good kids. Um, but, but and some of them need discipline. But like you totally love us as you know your family and and vice versa, and everyone can feel it. And and that's why I was always drawn to the Nog is because you made it feel like it's our safe haven, and everyone can like crap on Daytona all they want, but everyone from Jacksonville to Melbourne to Orlando and everywhere in between comes to the Nog to do a show because they know that they get paid like if they're headlining. And you don't run a sh you know shady business like most folks do, and <laughs> and all that good stuff. And well, and the great thing about the Nog is that people know they're people know they're not going to get paid, and they come anyway. And I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very clear about it. I'm like, I have no money for you, but you can come here; it'll be fun. And they're like, okay. <laughs> Indeed, but it means a yeah. lot knowing that I can you know have like a birthday show there and an anniversary show there, and like all I have to do is just ask you. And, and you've done that for me like the past four years and it means more than you'll ever know. And even if I throw ding dongs at people and stuff. Oh man. But I I I miss doing stand up with you and and my, that's what, what they I, need. They they deserve worse, honestly. They deserve full on hot dogs. Absolutely. Just smack them in the face with it. Um some of my favorite memories with you is like um like oh, traveling right. Um, like driving to Jacksonville and Orlando to do to do mics or just to be like a road dog. Like, what made you branch out to all those things and not just focus on staying in Daytona? Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, oh, geez, sorry, but my girlfriend's neighbor is just the loudest person that's ever lived. Um, <laughs> she's very nice, but she's. She's a bullhorn for a mouth. Um, yeah, the, the going on the road, you know, even when it's just the local stuff, because that's the that's when it's some fun. And I think a, a lot of people, when you listen to, to comics who are professional, you know, way way above us, professional comedians will tell you the most fun they they had was in the early days of just like doing mics with their friends because it's like it's like that time where you're, you're able, you're, you're learning and you're becoming better, but you're also just having a good time, you know? Cause once you get past that, once you get to the level of like being a professional going on the road and stuff, I mean, it's fairly lonely, you know? I mean, you, you might go out with a friend, you know, like, like I've done with my buddy, Brian, you know, shout out Brian Ziola. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, if you're not out with a, with a buddy or something, it can be, uh, you know, it can be, uh, real lonely um you know I, I haven't gotten to that place luckily so <laughs> i've i've stayed happy and able to see other people that i know because i refuse to be a professional yep that's <laughs> that's my stance i refuse indeed speaking of going on tour and such you also went on tour with um our mutual buddy billy with uh, the glorious rebellion and um what were those um tour stories like yeah. oh man that shit was whew, that was that was wild uh we had a lot of fun um there was uh the typical tour moments where you know like uh like the drummer um oh first of all it was already kind of rough opening for a metal band because then you're just like I know you guys aren't here for comedy, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> so let's all try and do get through it together, huh? Uh, but no, metal crowds are super cool. They're super chill. I never had anybody be shitty or anything. Like it was, it was cool. Um, I've had regular comedy crowds be worse, honestly, because <laughs> people are just stupid and don't know how to watch a show. But um, yeah, it was fun. Um, the The weirdest night was when we were in Mississippi. It was a, it was like a Tuesday. And there was no local gig on the on the on the booking, so there or there was no local band on the booking, so 
So it was just two out of town bands. So there was no local draw or anything. It just like almost no one was there. And a couple of local people from the music scene came out and they were super cool, but uh, doing stand up to eight people who aren't even there for the music, much less to stand up with. That was interesting. I did the blow your brains out bit. And uh, a guy just said, my nephew did that. And I was like, okay, well he stole my joke. So fuck your nephew. Um, <laughs> He deserved to die. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it was a lot of fun. By the end of it, I was tired and ready to get back. And uh, I just started talking to uh, Sarah, who was my girlfriend now, but she wasn't my girlfriend at the time. So I spent most of the trip uh, texting with her and everything and because we really like each other, but we wouldn't admit it, that kind of thing. And uh, now we're in love. Oh, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but yeah, man, it was a cool experience. It was a lot, it was a lot of fun. Awesome. And then uh, I was supposed to go out with Brian again uh, right before all the COVID stuff hit. I was out in California and then got back. We were supposed to leave for tour like a week later, and then COVID started shutting everything down, and just got worse and worse. And <laughs> and now we're all talking on the phone, so that's interesting. It is pretty interesting. It breaks my heart knowing that we can't. There's nothing like having a life setting of stand up and and speaking of life settings, I've seen you perform at, you know, the Nog, which is like a, a dive bar, if you will, and and at the Orlando Improv like twice. Like what are some pros and cons of that you faced? Uh, uh whether it's, you know, dive bar to an A room, if you will. Um the the best part about the dive bar thing is you can do whatever you want, say whatever you want. And of course, the trade-off with that is, with most things in life, if you're, when you have freedom to do things, it comes with a lot of variables, a lot of things that you would never expect. Like the stories that I have from the Nog are things you almost would never have happened in a typical club setting. So, uh, but I also was able to say we were able to like that metal intro we do. Yeah, that, where that. we just yeah, where we just scream and act like we're gonna do a hardcore show, and then we start doing stand up. That is something you typically wouldn't see club unless that was like what that comedian did. You know what I mean? Like he had his crowd, he or her brought their own crowd out, that type of thing. But like, so so you're able to have a lot more freedom with things, but you know you also have people just randomly coming up to you and trying to fight you during the middle of so my girlfriend's just remaking the bed and throwing sheets at me while I'm doing the life. <laughs> we got new, we got new bedding and she's super excited. So she's just literally covering. Me. Look at this. It's just stuff. It's just, she's just covering me in household items while I'm, while I am live on the Facebook. <laughs> um, but yeah, so when you're in a club, the great part about, club setting is that you're just like guaranteed like if you are even a remotely functional comedian you know what i mean like like you don't have to be very good to get laughs because people are so ready to laugh you know uh but what makes you good is doing the dive bars and stuff like that and by the time you get to that in like I used to I remember when I when I first started, all I wanted to do eventually I was like, Man, I want to do those kind of big places and then but all that training from doing all the small rooms and having to really fight for those laughs and fight the audience, sometimes physically. <laughs> By the time you get to do an actual club and you just step out and you're just like, Hey, and people just laugh at like the way you say things. You know what I mean? Like that's how they're just so ready to laugh. That like if you just use a different inflection on your voice than you did ten seconds ago, I think it's funny. You're just so happy <laughs> to be. It's it's almost like you almost feel like you're like. Do you people need to see a doctor? <laughs> this is, you don't seem fine. You're just laughing way too easily. But yeah, so it's uh. It, but that's the thing is that you. So when you like, when you like crush with that kind of crowd, you it's you you know why it's you when you crush with that kind of crowd you're like oh this is because i did all that other stuff so um 
I feel bad for everybody that got that got the early pass. You know, it's like you got to start out in clubs, and that's cool. But like, you'll you almost you got to ride with with training wheels for a while. You know what I mean? Yeah. You should get thrown into the pit of shit that you have to climb out of, so you can appreciate what it's like to not be covered in shit. Absolutely. In my humble opinion. Yeah. It's like the movie The Descent. And speaking of it, like movies. You worked on films before. Um, uh, you yeah. did stand up and worked in a movie shop. What were those days like? Um, stressful but fun. You know, when you're when you're younger and you're working on when you're doing production work, it's uh, it wears you out. But at the end of the day, you're just like you have fun and everybody parties and like the cast parties and the weekends and everything like that because we wouldn't shoot on Sundays and like. It was a lot of fun, but you were working, you know, 12 to 20 hour days sometimes, um, you know, just it's exhausting, but I can't even imagine doing that now. Like if somebody was like, Hey, do you want to just drag a bunch of equipment down a beach and then we'll film for a little while and then you can drag it all back and then put it all in a truck and we'll pay you, uh, will pay you a hundred dollars a day. I'd be like, I'd want to say no, but I'd take it because I need the money, <laughs> but I wouldn't be my first choice. I wouldn't be like, yeah, yeah. Give me hundreds of pounds of equipment and I'll drag it through the sand. That sounds fun. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a, a fun time. It was back when we were still, the Nog was still once a month, so it wasn't as stressful. I mean, I had, I would have to take, I, I wasn't able to do shows while we were doing production, but as soon as, I mean, as soon as production was over, I'd be back in the, you know, back in the nog. So I actually brought a cast party from the first film that I worked on. I said, uh, anybody, I, I told the locals, anybody who wants to come see a show, you know, and they came and watched me perform and saw everybody else back in the day. So that was cool. You know? Indeed. And struggling back to the nog, I remembered like other sh uh, shows, comedy shows that you would produce there, like uh, podcasts and uh, roasts and, all those specialty shows. What which, which specialty show uh, stood out the most, and why? Um, the ones where we did when we were, I I was really wanting to do the thing from Project Green or from, I keep calling it Project Green. It's just called the Green Room. It was a Paul Provenza show. Um, it had two seasons on Showtime, and it was really cool. It was where he like got comedians to sit and talk about the world of comedy and their experiences, but it was all famous comedians. And I thought it'd be cool to do with us because, you know, it's such an interesting environment for us and it was cool. You know, it was, it was fun, but it was just like, um, the first couple went good, but then after a while it's like, yeah, people don't want to sit and listen to unknown comedians talk about comedy. <laughs> like, yeah, it's real crazy doing open mics and people was like, okay, we got it. <laughs> But yeah, those were a lot of fun, but it did lead into kind of trying out other stuff where we did like the election of 2016, where we all pretended to be candidates with platforms and we had debates like that was a lot of fun. Um, pretty much just mocking, you know, the, the, the debate, uh, debates that were happening because they were ridiculous. You know, it was Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton's just walking around acting like she's conscious and Donald Trump was sitting there trying to act like he's not a fucking monster. So that was fun. Um, he was just like, move, sit in the back, yeah, whatever. So, um, so we did that. That was a lot of fun. We did one called Comedians Do the News um, where we just did like an hour long thing where it was like different segments of the news. So like Jack would be like man on the street, sort of like what we tried to do with the live thing. It didn't work as well with the live stream, but we had him walk around in the audience with a mic and you know talk to people as if he wasn't in the buildings and that was a lot of fun um richard dickerson did the weather you know stuff like that so it was it was fun um we did the improvised show called it straight out of noggin um because it was right when sure that Compton had come out and so everything had that label on it um we did a heckler show a crowd work show you know it was that kind of stuff where I, we, we just wanted to spice it up a little bit and not just do regular stand up. And everybody's always said they want to 
bring that back, but it takes a lot of work and people have to write and I don't trust anybody to do it. You can see what happens with the roast. They're like half of them right and half of them don't. And then we got to put up with your fucking terrible roasts. Like <laughs> I, I get it. They feel bad. They're like, I didn't write and I don't want to drop out. So I got to sit here and just bomb my dick off. You know, it just happened. But, <laughs> but yeah, we had a lot of fun, man. The, the roast of Satan was a lot of fun. Um, the roast of uh, Christmas. Was it the roast of Christmas? There was a Christmas roast of... I don't remember how we did it, but yeah, we, you remember that when we we had 14-person roster and all that. So that was a lot of fun, you know? Yeah, I was surprised everyone fit on stage, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, I had to clear it off. and it's. Uh, I come from a theater background. I have a degree in theater. Not everybody knows that. It's completely useless. But uh, I'm, I've... I used to direct and uh, I was able to block, as they say in the biz, I was able to block out how to put 14 people on the Tiernan Ugg stage effectively. <laughs> That's pretty it's awesome. Too many. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Big time. Man. Um, let's see here. What else should we cover? What are your, some of your favorite rooms in Florida and, and rooms that you've done in across country? Well, this is something that that everybody needs to kind of think about. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give some shout out ones, and then I can kind of say what I want to say about that. But uh, but so open mics, RIP to them. Open mics in Melbourne, incredible place. There's still a coffee shop though, so if you're ever in Melbourne, Florida, go to Apocalypse Coffee. They're fucking awesome. Um, but RIP open mics, probably one of the best shows you could ever go do, and we don't have it anymore because of what's going on right now. Um, Secret group, uh, um, Houston is pretty incredible. Um, I mean, there's great shows all over the country, so uh, but uh, everybody needs to kind of realize what's going on right now is not it's not going to be like this quick thing and then everything goes back to exactly how it was. It's not happening. So, if you care about where you go see shows, like what Ceres trying to do right now, raise, raise a little money for the dog, and what I did last last week where I did a fundraiser. Like these places are gonna need help. The government's not; they're not. Help's not coming. It's gonna be up to us. If you don't have money, then I know there's nothing you can do but share stuff and do it anyway. But places are going under, man, and like that. It's it's not gonna be. Everybody's trying to do shows right now, and it's like you're you're so busy trying to go do shows that you're not paying attention to what's happening like they're you're gonna if you're gonna do a show it needs to be to raise money for wherever you want to keep doing shows you know what i mean like so everybody needs to kind of get on the page of like this is this is not some temporary thing like we're we're kind of fucked if everybody doesn't try and keep these places open or keep these places able to reopen so that's what I'll say about places that I love. I, I love performing at most of the places that we've been to. Um, and even the ones I hate, I don't want them to go out of business, you know, fuck them, but I don't want them to go out of business, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so That's everybody we... sack up and do your part. And I'm so proud of you for like doing what you did and raising so much money for like all the local venues in Daytona and beach and, and what we're trying to do with the with these live streams, and I have like five going on because like I don't want my journalism to go away, and I really don't want the uh, venues to go away. So I'm raising funds that way, like five nights a week, and because we need places to perform, and we need those mom and pop shops to stay open, because without them, yeah. there's no us, you know. Yeah, that's that's really the the big thing is that if you really love stand up beyond just for how it makes you feel and like what it does for you and you love it for the art of it or you love the place where you do it that's where all the energy needs to go right now in, in my opinion i think it, it, if you unless the show you're doing unless the live show you're doing is somehow supporting the place you're at you know what i mean like like or like nog's not doing official shows right now but if i was to do a show there i wouldn't take any money from him you know so i uh, i uh, everybody needs to be trying to keep the places because open mics was doing well, man. If open mics can go, the place you love can go. So pay attention and do what needs to be done. Take care of your communities. People are going to be, it's going to get a lot worse. So people need to try and like figure out how to take care of each other. 
Absolutely. In my humble opinion. Yeah. Indeed. I promise you that we won't go over 30 minutes. And so we're almost at 30 minutes. And You're a sweet boy. I appreciate that. I got to look. I'm just going to be real with you. Just want to watch some Star Wars and eat some ice cream like a fat piece of shit. And I'm pretty <laughs> excited about that. So. Awesome. <laughs> Oh man, I I love you, Zach, and thank you so much for uh, for everything that you've done for my career and everyone else's careers. Like you are a true godfather, and from Daytona Beach and beyond, and you mean the world to us. And I want you to know that. And thank you so much for everything. Well, I love you too, Ben. I appreciate that, and uh, I don't know how to take compliments, so I'll just say thank you. And uh, <laughs> Uh, everybody, do what you got to do. Keep places open. Sell your body. Whatever you need to do. Suck suck people off <laughs> if it keeps them open, okay? Get yep. out there and do your part. And while you're at it, donate to um, the NOG below if you can. And follow us on socials and subscribe and all that stuff. And with that said, yep. we're over by a minute. And I apologize <laughs> that. Go You're eat fine. ice cream and watch your Star Wars. And I will <laughs> see you soon, I hope. All right, buddy. Good awesome. talking to you. Great talking to you, Dak, Zach. I'll see you later. <laughs> All right, buddy. Later, bud. Bye. Bye. So, yeah, that was Zach, the godfather of stand-up comedy. And um, we will definitely see you all soon. Uh, tune in next week. JT is my guest um, on the show. Um, with around the tray with Serethne. All righty, folks. See you next week. <laughs>